Um, the focus of this month has been about wall building. And um, the first week we talked about the fact that Jerusalem had a temple in the middle of the city and walls around the city, which really speaks to us of the fact that Jesus is to be the center of our life and we're to build our, our lives upon the principles of the word of God. The walls around the city and the gates in the cities, you know, uh, it, it means that the gates are there to, to help us keep the influence of the enemy out of our lives. Uh, we govern what comes in and what goes out and it allows us to go out and minister to people as well. Last week we looked at being living stones in the wall and the pillars that are needed to keep a church strong. Last year, the week after uh, Valentine's Day, Pastor Debbie and I team taught and we were talking about marriage and we kind of walked through the vows of, uh, of marriage and it was kind of fun. And, uh, uh, and so we want to team teach again this week, just a little bit different. Uh, she can join me up here, but I hope everyone had a great Valentine's Day. Um, it was Valentine's Day number 48 for Debbie and myself, 48. And uh, 43 of those Valentine's Day were as a married couple and five of them were when we were going out, as they used to say. Uh, I don't know what it was. We just saw each other in church, you know, but it was, we were together in that sense. And I had to, I had to think about whether it was 48 or 47 because um, there was a couple of months we weren't together. And, and when I thought about it, I realized how financially savvy this, this girl is because she waited until after Valentine's Day to break up with me. <laughs> so she got her cheap box of chocolate candy. And then on my 17th birthday, she broke up with me. That way she wouldn't have to get me a present. And so we were apart about two months and this is the 45th anniversary of that coming up. And uh, so it still hurts and I just had to, I just had to get that out. But um, before we share uh, with all, uh, begin to share and with all the mush and love that we've just gone through this past week, I'd like to share with you a real touching story I, I read as a follow up to Valentine's Day. It just really moved my heart. But a married couple was in a very crowded mall when she realized her husband was not beside her or anywhere in sight and realizing how much shopping was left to do and with limited time to do it, she called him on his cell phone. Where are you? She asked. You know, we have a lot to do. I look around and you've disappeared. And he answered, do you remember the jewelry store we were in not too long ago and you saw that diamond necklace you loved so much? We couldn't afford it, but I told you one day I would get it for you some way, somehow. And tears came into her eyes and her voice changed to an emotional whisper as she replied, yes, I remember. To which her husband said, well, I'm in the gun shop next door. <laughs> All right, at least the men laugh. But anyway, um, but as I share with you this morning, we're gonna teen teach just a little bit differently. And uh, so this is our first time kind of teaching this way, so it may be a little rough, so just, just bear with us. But uh, as I was thinking about building the walls and as I was thinking about marriage and relationships, I was thinking about building blocks that are important in building strong relationships. You know, um, these building blocks are vital in marriage, but they're also vital in friendships. You know, and uh, it doesn't have to center around marriage. So we want to talk about relationships, not just marriages, but we will talk about marriages because these are vital in that as well. So whether you're married or not, um, you know, we all have friendships that are important to us. And, and this is what we want to talk about. And so this morning we picked out six different building blocks that we want to share. And these are not in the order of importance, uh, nor are they the only building blocks, because I, I thought of a bunch more, but we only have so much time that we can talk about this. But there were just six of them that just kind of came to mind that we want to talk about. And again, these are, are, are vital for marriages, but they're also vital for friendships. And these are building blocks you need in your life, but also to... These are building blocks you want to look for in other people before you marry them or before you enter into a friendship with them. These are, these are very important things. And so, uh, Debbie's going to start with the first one. Give me a mic. Our first building block is identity. 
And we're living in a day and age where people really need to know their identity. And I don't know if, you know, I, I counsel people and sometimes in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, even further up, they struggle with who they really are, who, what they believe, what their morals are, what their um, foundations are. And so that's the purpose of a, a church family is to get involved and to be part of something that you can build a good foundation in your life on. And we're here because we have core values. We have things that we believe in and trust in. And I want to encourage all of us in looking at your identity. Know who you are in Christ Jesus. That is our foundation as Christians. Know what the Word of God says about who we should be in, in Christ Jesus. Know what the foundation of our morals should be. Even within the church nowadays, there's a, a multifaceted view of what's correct, what's, what's acceptable, what is unacceptable. And then, unfortunately, sometimes in today's uh, day and age, as far as identity goes, you know, people look at the churches and they'll say, oh, you're too judgmental because you won't allow this or that or the other. If we will just know what the Word of God says and stand on the Word of God and love people with the compassion of Jesus Christ, that's who we need to be, church. That's our identity. So your friends are going to come and go, right? How many of you have realized that in life? Now, um, my mom, uh, 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 she, she's 82 years old. She, I always admired her situation, and I know some of you are the same way. You've maintained friendships from your childhood. And my mother did this. As a result of that, her second husband now is her best friend from school's husband. <laughs> and that's a good thing. They knew each other their whole life. They're comfortable with each other. They are awesome companions. And it made it a blessing to our family because we knew him our whole life. We knew his first wife. And I'm not saying you have to maintain friendships so you have a second husband in the wings. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying, you know, it's, these are beautiful relationships. I always admired it because these ladies that she had grown up with and gone to school with and pout around when she was a teenager and she was the only one that had the driver's license back then, so she carted everybody around. And I hear them tell stories. I loved that. I thought it was so awesome. And so it's just unique that in that situation, God blessed her in her latter years with a beautiful companion. Amen? But the identity that these gals kept was amazing. Throughout their high school, they'd get together and tell stories. And then I'd listen to them because on, when we all lived at the, the farmhouse, they would have uh, get-togethers at our house and plan their, their reunions. And I would kind of play the maid so they could get about their business. And I'd listen to their stories. And I tell you, they might have been in their 50s, 60s. You know, but they were like teenagers when they got together again, and I love that. So the friendships that you make, sometimes in your youth, if you're blessed enough to maintain them and have them continue on in your life, that's an awesome blessing from God. But not everybody's going to do that. And you need to know, is you know, who... Who in these friends is going to value you? And do you value them? What is your worth and identity that's found in Christ Jesus, even in a situation like that? Because if we say we're Christians, we've got to have that Christian foundation, even if our friends aren't Christians. Amen? Proverbs 18, 24 says, A man who has friends must himself be friendly, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now, brothers can be close. Brothers can be far apart. Sometimes people have friends that are closer than their natural family. That's all right. But Jesus is your friend. He goes with you no matter where you go, no matter where you stay. Proverbs 18, 24 and the New Living Translation says it a little more plain. 
These are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. We've all had friends, I'm sure, when we look back over our life, they come and they go, and some of them are true friends. They've got your back. Sometimes they don't, right? Know your identity in Christ Jesus, and, and know that it's okay for some friendships to be laid down at times. It's okay if you have to walk away sometimes. Just know that, hear from the Lord about that, and do it in love. I never, I never try to burn bridges, no matter what I'm dealing with or who I'm dealing with. How'd you get out that out of one little paragraph? Anyway, um, I think going along with identity is the, the, the fact that we need to know who we are uh, as individuals, who God has made us to be. And I'm, not, I'm talking about our makeup, you know, what he's called us to do in life, what, and that kind of helps us. But we also need to know who we are in Christ. Um, I, I was, you know, those revelations, who we are, who God wants us to be as far as the talents, the gifts, the, the career, and the revelation of who we are in Christ, I believe helps us, keeps us from being needy people. And what I mean by needy people is people that, you know, you're depending on somebody else for your identity. You're, you're depending on somebody else to meet your needs. And, and that's just not going to happen. I, I love Galatians 6.2. It says, bear one another's burden, so fulfill the law of Christ. So in order to bear somebody else's burden, we can't be the ones with burdens all the time. You know, I know that we all have, we go through times where, you know, things are difficult and we have needs. And so, um, you know, we, we need the help of other people, but that can't be our normal existence. We've got to be to the point where we're confident in who we are. We're confident in Christ in us so that we can minister to our friends. And, and it's a, you know, because if, if you've been around a needy relationship, you know that needy relationships drain you. You, I've been around people and I leave and I am so exhausted that, you know, you just feel like every bit of life has been sucked out of you. And then I've been around people that you go there to minister to them and all of a sudden you, you just leave, feel like you're walking on a cloud because they minister to you. It's just this, this awesome thing. So those, those type of relationships are, are those identity things are, are so vital. The second one that we thought about was consistency. You know, I was thinking about consistency. I was thinking about stability and consistency in a lot of different areas. One of those areas was emotional consistency. Now, we, we all have bad days. You know, uh, there are times when the husband goes to work or the wife comes home from work and they're grumpy because they had a really bad day. Or you're not feeling really well and, you, and you're grumpy. So we have those kind of days. But what I'm talking about is continually not knowing what to expect from your friend or from your spouse as far as emotions go. You know, uh, they may be happy one minute and then all of a sudden they bite your head off. And so there's, there, there's no peace in that kind of relationship because you don't know how to react. You know, you ever heard the, I'm sure you've heard the expression, I, I walk around on eggshells when I'm around that person. It's because you don't know how they're gonna react. Proverbs 22, verses 24 and 25 in the Message Bible says, don't hang out with angry people. Don't keep company with hotheads. Bad temper is contagious. Don't get infected. All right? And, and, and I think that's vital because, you know, from a pastor standpoint, in order for me to trust someone in a position of leadership or influence, I have to be able to trust their emotions. Um, there, there were some people over the years that came here to church that I can only elevate so far because I didn't trust their emotions. Uh, I, I, I didn't trust the fact that there wasn't going to be a time when something happens and there's this big outburst and then I have to pick up the pieces of that. So, you know, you have to be, in order to trust somebody, they have to be emotionally uh, consistent. It, it can also speak of decision making, especially concerning finances. You know, in a marriage, it's important that each spouse be consistent in that area. Uh, you know, being wisely spontaneous can be fun, but being fiscally irresponsible can destroy a marriage or even a friendship. Yes. 
you know, if you, you, if you don't know what your spouse is going to be doing with the finances, that, that is a challenging thing to deal with. You know, if you can trust them in that area, if they're consistent and making fairly good decisions. Now, I know we've all made bad decisions. I've made bad financial decisions. But um, I, I don't believe in my history that that's been the norm. It's been the exception. You know, so I believe I, I trust her and she trusts me in the area of finances. And, and when it comes to friends, it's the same way. Um, there, there needs to be a consistency in character. Um, from a negative standpoint, consistency can be a warning sign for us, especially when we're picking a mate for marriage. If, they're, if that person is consistently making bad decisions, then you gotta realize that that's not gonna change when you get married. That's right. They're gonna keep doing the same thing. If it's a friend and you look at it, they're just making these moral, uh, uh, bad moral decisions all the time, you know, it, that typically is not gonna change. And, and let me say this, this is important, especially for females. Women and young ladies, and, and I've just seen this over the years, they're notorious for entering into a relationship with this handsome guy that they believe that they can fix. And the problem is, is when they get into that relationship, they give their hearts away too soon. And by the time they realize they can't fix them, they're in love. And, and so, um, you know, th that's what happens. But Matthew chapter seven says, uh, even so every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree will bear bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. So the question is, well, don't people change? Well, they do, but it's got to be a heart change. It's got to be something that takes place in the heart. And what I've seen is a lot of times people will make adjustments just so they can win that other person's heart. But once the, the deal is done, then they just revert back to their old ways because they really haven't changed. It's just this modified adjustment just to win the person's heart. You know, um, some believe that if they kiss a frog, it'll turn into a prince. But the reality is, is that you get what you kiss, all right? It's as simple as that. So consistency and stability is a crucial building block, I think, too. Okay. Number three is purpose. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 10, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, and we should walk in them. In other words, grace is a gift. You cannot earn it. It doesn't matter how many hours you give in to the church each week. It doesn't matter what you do. It, it's each of us get that grace, that gift. And I'm so glad I don't have to earn it because I don't deserve it. That's why it's called amazing grace, right? Because it's amazing. We don't deserve it. So none of us live unto ourselves. The Bible says that if we live, we live to the Lord. And so if the purpose of our life is to glorify God in relationships, then we need to do just that, glorify God. If you are a Christian, quit trying to be like everybody else out there. You raise the standards for your friends, your family, the people around you. You don't lower them and come down. Oh, I gotta walk in love because if I don't go to the casinos, now I'm gonna stop right there. I'm not gonna, you know, because I, I have certain convictions in my life that I won't do. For me, they're convictions. It's a purpose. I have purposed in my life, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to go to bars drinking. I don't like it. I don't wanna do it. I come from a long line, I've told you before, half of them were teetotalers, the other half were alcoholics. I'm not gonna, that's a 50-50 chance I don't wanna take with myself. I love my life the way it is. So I don't even do wine. It's up to you, that's between you and God. But purpose in your heart, purpose in your life, because of the grace that God's given you. See, I've watched people become alcoholics because they've delved into this grace issue and they felt that because there's so much grace 
they can do whatever they want. That's what we call greasy grace. That's an old term, an old church term. And I've watched them and I, you know, I've talked to them blue in the face. I'll give them scriptures and on. I know there's other scriptures. They can prove different things. And finally I said, it comes down to what you believe. What is your purpose in being a Christian? Does it benefit you, your family, or those that God brings around in your circle? Does it benefit them if you go in and you plow through and you sit at a bar and drink with them? Because I said many times over the years, pastoring is not a whole lot different than being a bartender. I didn't get any amens on that. <laughs> I didn't really expect them. But you see, I told you, in, in my childhood, I grew up, every weekend was a party weekend for us. We voted. It was party central. It was family time, but it was party time. When I got to the age, God, you know, the grace of God was there in my life at a young age. I got saved at a young age. Thank God I did. My life would have taken a whole different path. I'm not saying it would have been bad. I'm just saying for me, I've had a good life and I enjoy it. And I haven't missed out on anything. I haven't. And so I learned from a very young age, I did not want to marry certain types of individuals because I watched the way they were. And you've, told, you've heard me tell this before. So I'm gonna move past that now and say, know your purpose in life. While friendships can bring us much joy, our relationships are not just about us. We're in a day and age where everybody wants to say, what's in it for me? What do I get out of it? Well, that's not really why we do what we do here in life, right. church. We're here, we're occupying until he comes. It's not just about what you and I get out of a relationship, and we'll talk a little more about that later. Friendships bring us much joy. They are to be lived joyfully and with expectant hope in God for his glory and fame, not for our glory and fame. We all know that there's positions in life, and we call it schmoozing. If you, if you have a business, uh, pastors do it too. When we go to conferences, we look at each other and it's like, I'm so not in the schmoozing game. I don't care what organization or who you are, you know when you go to business places and conferences and things, you schmooze. That's an old term. You go around, you try to make connections. Um, what, what's the new term for it? Networking, networking, you network. So I stand back and it's like, I'm done. I, I am who I am. I'm Popeye. Some of you don't even know Popeye, do you? <laughs> Whoa. Whole generation doesn't even know who Popeye is. Come on. He was the best. And olive oil. Gosh. Popeye was always, I am what I am. And that's all that I am. And basically it's like, you know, I don't care if people like me or not, I'm not here to schmooze or network. You can do certain things and you do it for a reason, but I, I don't like kissing up to people, I never have. And I don't want anybody faking that out and kissing up to me. And I can stand here and smile right in your face when you're doing it to me and know what you're doing and just think I could care less. It's amazing grace and it's purpose that God gets us through. So guard your relationships and know what you, you need in a relationship, but more not what you need, but what you are to be in a relationship. Because if you're truly gonna let God ordain your footsteps, it'll be a much easier and better path. You know, I consider you all friends, but we're not all super close because I don't know what you do every day. I don't need to know. But there's one, I would trust you before I trust others that I know nothing about because I know your core values. I know you believe in God. You know, I'm gonna go with you before I'll go with a white witch coven somewhere. Right? right? Come on. There's more, more out there that we don't know about and you need to know who has your back. You need to know your purpose. All right.
The fourth building block is um, what I would call loyalty and commitment. I think they're they're the same thing. You know, one one man asked another, "How long have you been married?" And the guy replied, "46 years." And he says, "Wow, 46 years! What is the secret to being married that long?" And the other man replied, "Well, we never got a divorce." <laughs> what I'm talking about in loyalty and commitment is more than just not leaving. Right. Right. right? It's it, it's it's being together. There's support. There's there's a pouring into it. It's not just lip service, and, and that is more done than it is said. You know, I, I, I've been pastoring for 30 years and I've had so many people over the years come up to me and they tell me, you know, Pastor Mike, I want you to know I am with you until the end. If I will be the last person that ever leaves and they're the first whenever a challenge goes. So whenever somebody, it's what they call that the kiss of, it's like when an owner tells a manager, yeah, he's my manager. I, I really support him. They call that the kiss of death or something like that, you know. Uh, I, I always just look and say, okay, I, I, I accept that. But then I've had other people who never say it, people like Jim and Mary Lou Hoops, who have been with me for 30 years of pastoring, who have never told me, Pastor Mike, I'm going to be, I would be the last one to leave. But they're here. They love us. They support us. They support the church. They've seen me at my best. They've seen me at my worst. And they still love me. And, and I am so grateful for that. Uh, Proverbs 17, 17 says, a friend is always loyal and a brother is born to help in time of need. I just love that. That's what loyalty and commitment is. You know, you, you don't, you're not friends when everything's great and then when things become the challenge, you leave. You're, you're there to help through that need and, and, and strengthen. When I think of loyal people that are committed in the Bible, I think of Elisha to Elijah. You know, uh, uh, 2 Kings 2.2, 2, Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And he didn't leave him. And, and, and God really blessed him because of that. I think of Jonathan's armor bearer. When Jonathan decided, he said, I'm just going to go up and I'm going to climb up this cliff. and I'm going to attack this enemy garrison of soldiers. And his armor bearer said to him, you know, do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am with you according to your heart. I mean, that armor may have, may have thought, what a stupid idea. There's a bunch of guys up there. You're by yourself, plus you're climbing up a cliff to get to them. But he said, I'm going to go with you. And they went up and they beat the, uh, they beat the garrison. They killed 20 guys that time, just the two of them. And then it opened up the door for Israel to gain a victory over the Philistines that day. He may have thought it was a crazy idea, but he did it anyway. I'm sure Jim and Mary Lou over the years have thought, that's crazy. But they've supported me in that. Amen. We think of Ruth and Naomi. And, and Ruth chapter 1, verse 17, Ruth, uh, Naomi, uh, Ruth said to Naomi, when you die, I'll die. There will I be buried. The Lord do so to me. And more also, if anything but death parts you and me. I mean, that's the type of commitment that we have in friendships, but especially in a marriage. You know, when we do those vows till death do us part, that means that we, we are committed. We're not even thinking about, it. you know, uh, I, I think that some people marry, but they never merge. The Bible says that we're to become one. A man, a man and a woman come together. They become one flesh. And, and so Adam said of Eve, she's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. I mean, there's that oneness there. And, and so when trials come, it's important that you stay connected as one. Hard times can either break you or bond you, depending on whether you cleave to each other or you leave one another. So take the opportunity to grow closer to each other. Instead of disconnect in the midst of difficult seasons, make sure you're communicating to your spouse, I am with you. You know, being committed to one another. I'm committed to this woman here. If she would ever leave me, I would just go with her. <laughs> It's the same with friendships. You know, we have our ups and downs, but when you stick it out, it's so rewarding. And what I've seen about friendships over the years is we have friends that we've known for a long period of time. And there are friends that I, I, I've thought about over the years where you were so close for a period of time. And then for whatever reason, you know, they move away, life happens. You, you, you don't see each other very often. 
And then the next time you see them, it's just like you never knew them. But I've had the same friends who I haven't seen in a long time. And you get back together, it's like you just pick up right where you left off. And I don't know why that is that way, but it's just an interesting, you know, when it comes to friendships. And, uh, and so it's just awesome to have friends for a long period of time and then, you know, you invest in their lives and, and, and it's great. Uh, the fifth building block is trust. Trust is such a big uh, factor in relationships, especially marriages. In fact, I believe that the biggest hurdle we have in our relationship with Jesus is learning to trust in him. You know, if, if we can't trust Jesus, then, then we're going to have, there's not going to be any peace in our relationship. Second Samuel seven twenty eight says, O sovereign Lord, you are God. Your words are trustworthy and you have promised these good things to your servant. Pa Psalm 9 verse 10 says, may everyone who knows your mercy keep putting their trust in you for they can count on you for help no matter what. O Lord, you will never, no, never neglect those who come to you. We sang the song this morning, you know, I'm marching around these walls. I thought that by now they'd fall, but you have never Amen. failed me yeah. yet. Right. There's this trust that we have in God and we need the same trust in our uh, spouses and even in friendships. You know, uh, when we can trust our spouse, when we can trust our friends, we can live in peace. But when somebody breaks that trust, even though we, we still maintain a relationship with them, it takes more effort to regain that trust than it took to get it the first time. Trust is so vital and, and, and it's so important. Trust includes a couple of traits. I was thinking about honesty. You know, that, that means just being able to speak to each other, be honest with one another. Ephesians chapter five tells us that, or chapter four says that we are to speak the truth in love. You know, that means that I, I want people to speak into my life. I want them to, to tell me things. I want them to help me to grow and be candid with me. The other one is confidentiality. Have you ever shared something with someone and, and you just said, look, this is my heart. I, I just need you to, and then you find out they told somebody else. That's, that's very difficult to go through. You, I, I'm sure you probably never tell that person anything again. It's a violation of confidentiality. So fellowship is built on confidentiality. You'll never develop any close relationships without it. In fact, the quickest way to destroy um, uh, anything is it, it, gossip. So there, there, um, there are dozens of verses about that. Proverbs eleven thirteen just one says, you can't trust gossipers with a secret. They'll just go blab it all. Put your confidence instead on a trusted friend for he will be faithful to keep it in confidence. So, you know, the church, our marriages, our friendships ought to be the safest place in the world Amen. when it comes to these kind of things. And so I would encourage you, you know, Trust also means not hiding anything from your spouse. Not hiding anything from your spouse because uh, be, being open and honest, you know, when we start hiding things, that opens the door for suspicion. And when that happens, it just destroys trust. And, and then it's gonna be so hard to get back on that, that footing again. Amen, amen. And that goes along with your phones, your apps, your, uh, all the things you deal with on a computer you know at any point in time he can pick my phone up i'm okay with that because i have nothing to hide from him and he's the same way so here's, i'm just going to bring example. it down here's just an example that happened recently remember the snow sunday that we were off and i was um i got this text from a person that i knew a female that I knew when I was a kid. And she just happened to be, I guess, you know, with the snow, she happened to be getting on Facebook and just, she found me. And then so she was asking me about uh, if, if there were, if we had any recordings of me and my brother and my sister singing. And, uh, you know, I told her we didn't. And, and so the conversation uh, went on a little bit more. But when Debbie got up and she came in, I just handed her my phone and said, you know, I just wanted you to know, I, I just had this conversation. And so, you know, it's nothing to be concerned about or anything like that. So anyway, just be honest and don't hide anything. Right. You know, if, if she'd have come in and she'd have looked at my phone and saw this message from this woman, female, and not knowing who it was, then it, you know, it, it wouldn't have been good. So I just showed it to her. I just said, okay, this, this is so you know. We just had this conversation. And now she and I are best friends on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> it's the way it works. 
and I'm sure we'd be best friends in the natural. I'm, I'm looking forward to maybe someday having a cup of coffee with her and hearing some old stories. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was 11 years old, I'm telling you. <laughs> now, my last one is forgiveness. And keep in mind, we've talked about he's mostly covered marriages. I call it covered friendships in our personal walk and, and life with the Lord. And this is so hard. You could do a series on what we're trying to do here in just a um, few minutes. But forgiveness, contrary to popular notion, it's okay to be taken advantage of. It's biblical to lay down your life for one another at times. And I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm about to say, but it's okay. It's not okay to be manipulated or to remain divisive or in a controlling relationship, but it's, it's um, loving and, and biblical to maintain a friendship in which you um, can serve God. But if it gets to the point where you can't pursue God's glory and pursue loving one another, then you need to look at situations at times we will find ourselves in situations it might be a marriage it might be a friendship and the term they would use nowadays would maybe be toxic it's become a toxic uh, friendship or relationship if you have and i say a big if you have allowed god i will repeat that if you have allowed god to allow this friendship or relationship in your life and not just yourself it's something you wanted then there might be a season while god will have you in those relationships or that marriage that you are there to help that individual grow past what they are dealing with in life now, what do I mean to say it, it, uh, about this is that your friends are going to let you down at times. How many of you know when we have friendships, they're not perfect people? I mean, I'm not a perfect person, so I, um, I don't think I attract perfect people. In fact, I really can't stand to be around perfect people. I'm okay, I'm more than okay if you just wanna be real with me. I cannot stand it when people put on a front and I read right through that. I have done that since I was a kid, I'll never change, and I'm just getting too old to even worry about it right now. So I'll probably just say, just be real. You know, after I've talked to you a while, and my bluntness at times, you all know, can be, <laughs> he knows, but he said he'd never leave me. Even if I try to leave him, he's going with me. So <laughs> blunt is blunt. But I, in my bluntness, it's because I like realness. I like to be real. I want people to be able to look at me. And I, and I hope you all know, those of you that have been here by now, I hope you know the same Pastor Deb and Pastor Mike you see at church is the one you see at our house, our home, our places we've gone vacationing with ski and pam and, and todd and sharon we're basically the same i think aren't we when we go we just have a good time and um in our laundry i i admit to that i own that sometimes I, you know i probably say and do things i shouldn't do but not in a bad way and i can't even blame it on wine because i don't drink wine so i'm being real but we're gonna be in relationships sometimes. So what I mean by this is your friends let you down and sometimes we have to do what the word of God says, like Peter, 70 times seven. I can't, that scripture, that's so hard sometimes, isn't it? How many of you have ever been in situations like that? I have to remember to stay put. When you're in a situation and you're going through it and it's tough and you want to be there for the individual but you know they repeatedly let you down or you know there's patterns in their life that they're going to go around i call it the same merry-go-round ride i like merry-go-rounds in the natural it's about the only ride i can ride at the amusement park now but i don't like hopping on the same ride and going round and around with the same individual 
over and over and over again. Right. Sooner or later, the 70 times 7, you have to go to the Holy Spirit and you have to say, what's going on here? Do I have to stay, Lord, or can I go? Do I have to let go? Am I here for their salvation? Because you know, sometimes we don't save them, but sometimes God puts us in relationships and marriages and in situations in our life that he puts us there to sustain individuals, to keep them alive. Because you don't know where they'd be without you sometimes. Now, that doesn't mean we take on a false burden of having to be their right. salvation. Right. You understand that? God doesn't want us to have those false burdens in our life either. In 1 Corinthians 10, 33, it says, For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Remember, when you enter into a relationship, whether it's a friendship or a marriage covenant, you're not entering into it today and can exit tomorrow if you don't like it anymore. If you enter into marriage, I'm like, once you say I do, you done did. For good, for bad, you get the bad, the good, bad, the ugly. And there's days it's ugly. If it's abuse, pastors, remind me, if it's abuse, and I'm talking, you're getting drop kicked around or something like that, I'll be the first one to say, baby, pack a bag, I'll be there to pick you up. But I remember when I got married, and, and I was young, 17, he was 19, my parents said to, to him, if she's mean to you, you can come home. So, you know, they gave him an outlet, but my mom didn't let me come home. You know, it's like, you know, kind of like one of those, she didn't say suck it up buttercup, but I kind of knew once I said I do, it was going to be that way. Now, there are situations where individuals, and, and we all know individuals, sometimes you have to stick it out in friendship. You're going to give more than you get. That's why I say we're in these situations. We're not there as friends to just, you know, have a good time and what it, what's in it for us. God puts us in people's lives sometimes because we are the light. Whether, even if they're Christians, even if they're Christians, I don't know about you, but I've been in situations where I just need somebody to come alongside of me and hold my arms up. I'm tired. I've been through a lot. It is a blessing to me to have someone say, I'm praying for you and just give you a word of encouragement. And so there's those times where we're going to feel like we're doing the 70 times 7. That we haven't had a good word. Pastoring's a lot like that. That's why I say it's like bartending. And you sit and listen to people's problems and all. You never ask the bartender how he's doing. <laughs> the same. Do you know how many phone calls we get a week? And how many people actually say, how are you doing? Not wanting you to feel bad or nothing. I'm just saying, we're not in it for the warm, fuzzy feelings. We're in it because we feel called to be in it. We're in it because God said be in it. We're in it because he sustains us and encourages us. So you have to forgive at times, whether you feel like it or not. And I was talking to an individual, I think Friday evening, we'd gone out for dinner, some of us. And I said, oh, I'll be teaching on this. They were saying, they feel like for unforgiveness keeps us bound up from healings taking place in, in our lives and all. And we know that's kind of like Christian 101, right? But we can go along. Some of us have been saved 20, 30, 40 years. We can forget that little tidbit. And if you forget it and you're wondering why you're not receiving certain things in your life manifesting in the goodness of God, it can be because of that at times. You have to check that forgiveness level. And I'm here to tell you, I know it's hard to forgive. But sometimes God will allow you to stay in relationships and have you stay in relationships. Not because, you know, and you have to draw the line in the sand. You have to hear from the Holy Spirit. Right. What's, what's right. abuse? Not what the world calls abuse. 
But I, I mean, and he, he knows the way I am. I've always been this way. You want to go out that door, buddy, don't let the door hit you in the butt. Amen. <laughs> I've maintained that my entire life because I didn't marry him to fulfill every one of my needs. I married him because God brought him across my path. I fell in love with him, and we knew we were right for each other. Even as teenagers, we knew that. You don't hear us talk a whole lot about it when the young ones are in here. I don't really want them getting hooked up that young. But God was good. He knew what he was doing when he put us together. But I knew from a young age he was not going to be able to provide and um, do meet all my dreams come true. He was my Prince Charming, but I wasn't stupid enough to think he was never gonna fall off the white horse. You understand what I'm saying? Yep. He's a man. When I married him, he was a boy. <laughs> We're growing old together. It's a good thing. I still look at him sometimes and think, that's my man. And he gets up there and he sings one of them nice songs and I'm like, oh, that's my boy. Because I remember when he was young, when it starts on that, that's one of the reasons I just, you know, fell in love. I love hearing worship. He has an anointing on him. Yes. I love that. Which song? No, it's just a love song. <laughs> I'm saying that to say, ladies, your man ain't going to make all your dreams come true. And gentlemen, your woman's going to pack a few pounds on occasionally. And that's all I want to say about that. <laughs> Forgiveness goes a long way. Whether it's in a friendship or a marital relationship. But I will tell you this. If you've been married for 20, 30, 40 years, you know I love to teach on finances and you love, I, you know I like a good deal. That's why I don't go to the casinos. I don't like to lose. I just buy a big ring and be done with it. I know how much money I've spent. I'm good with that. Pay it off and it's good. I go on down the pipe. That's my thing. I like winning situations. When you enter a marriage covenant, you cannot just walk away. You need a purpose in your heart. You have an investment in this relationship. And you have to look at your, your friendships too. Do you have an investment in this relationship? There were certain friends in our life that he's, he's mentioned, talked about. I know to this day, I could knock on their door at midnight and they'd open the door, they'd bring me in if I needed a shower, they'd let me get a shower, they'd feed me, they'd clothe me, they'd, they'd take care of me and I would do the same for them. And I haven't seen them in years. Amen? There's something very precious about there's a treasure of a Christian friend who runs the race alongside of you. It's, it's a very precious thing. The gospel-based friendship with unbelievers demonstrates the love that God extended to us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But in all of our relationships, when we have that heart-to-heart -heart with Christians, it's, it's amazing. So we have to keep our eyes on what, what does God want us to do in these relationships? You know, uh, uh, when Susan came back, she's come back. We've known her probably 30 some years. And it's precious to see, you know, Mary Lou and Jim and I, we were all just so happy to see her because we've known her for 30 some years. I love that we're still running the race together. We might not always be together. It's, it's a good thing, right? We're running the race. And we're tired at times, but we're still running the race. It's a joy when you see a sister walking through the door. And she, yes, she's still running the race like we are. That is the most, one of the most precious gifts. And we have that over the years, some of the individuals, you know, that we haven't seen in ages. I want to encourage you, guard those friendships and relationships. But always make sure you're walking in forgiveness because... The forgiveness issue is so big that it will cut off your pipeline to God. Yeah. 
You can do all the things right you want to do, but you have hatred down in your heart. He and I will tell you, that's why we go above and beyond. We cannot do what we're doing and be in unforgiveness. It doesn't mean we can't judge certain things according to the word of God. It doesn't mean that we can't um, listen to the Holy Spirit and he can make adjustments in situations. And, we are, and nobody has to be a doormat. You understand what I'm saying in marriages and relationships. But I, will, I, I want to encourage us and end with forgiveness is the ultimate thing, no matter how old you grow in the Lord, how mature you think you are. If you can't function in the forgiveness, then it's going to clog up your pipeline to the Lord because that's basic for him. Amen. If he didn't love us, he wouldn't have done what he did on the cross of Calvary for us. That's right. Amen. Stay with me. This area of forgiveness is just so vital. That's why we wanted to end it with this. But um, forgiveness is a choice um, that we make. I just know that in 2000 and 14, I had just, you know, 25 years of pastoring and just dealing with the strain and the stress of that. And I just got to the point where I just needed some help. And so I, I went away for some ministry. And one of those areas that, um, that I had to deal with, and I thought I had dealt with it, as Pastor Debbie said, we try to walk in unforgiveness, was the fact of un unforgiveness. And so I just kind of made a list of things that had happened over the years and just began to confess them to the Lord. And, and um, there was just such a, a, a peace that, that came into my heart and such a healing that took place. There was other things. I, you know, I was just dealing with a lot of, a lot of stuff, self-worth and other things that that I just needed uh, God's opinion on and not other people's opinion. And just that area of forgiveness, unforgiveness was one of those. And as I, as I just, I confessed to the Lord and I just said, God, there's probably, if, if there's anything in my heart that's holding on to unforgiveness, please forgive me of that, reveal that to me so that I can get rid of it in my heart. And so during that ministry time, I just really feel like God just, did a whole work in my heart and just freed me of, of a lot of things and stuff I didn't even know was there. And, but it, it brought so much freedom. I came back a different person, which was vital since we found out, you know, about the cancer after that and had to walk through that together. But I just know that God wants us to be free of any type of unforgiveness. Yes. And so I don't want you to drum up anything. I'm just going to pray over us as we as we close the service. And, and I just want you to release that. Hmm. Maybe it's something that God wants you to deal with on a personal level with someone. And if that's the case, I mean, we can't always, if we did something to somebody and wronged them and we need to ask them forgiveness, you know, they may be halfway across the country by now. They may even be dead, you know. And, and, and there's no possible way that we can ask for forgiveness. But if there is, then maybe God would just reveal that person or that situation to us. Maybe it's just something where somebody did something to us. We just got to let it go mm -hmm. and just say, it's not going to bother me anymore or hold me down. So I just want to pray over us in that area. God, thank you for these building blocks that you've given us for friendships, relationships, and and Lord, in this area of unforgiveness, I just pray, God, that uh, you will help each one of us step into that fully. Lord, we, we, we don't deal with perfect people, and we're not perfect people. And so we've, we've hurt others, and they've hurt us. And, and, and God, the only way that our hearts can stay pure and free in order to be able to minister to other people around us is for our hearts to be free. And, and unforgiveness is the key in that area. So I just pray, God, that if there's any thing that we need to do, any confessions that we need to make, anybody that we need to talk to, Lord, that you will reveal that to us. Otherwise, God, just help us to let things go so that it doesn't fester in our hearts anymore. 
um, and, and that we are free from that. I just pray a blessing over this congregation, every, every person that's here. God, I just thank you for uh, new freedom and relationships that we have and helping us to grow stronger in character and in purpose and in identity, all of those things that we talked about. And I just thank you for blessing our marriages and blessing our friendships. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.